Dobro večer svima. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, večeras ćemo pričati na engleskom, iako naš gost jako dobro govori naš jezik, ali u svakom slučaju uh, govorit ćemo uh, 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 na engleskom o, um, o nekim paralelama između nekadašnje Jugoslavije i današnje, današnjeg Sjedinjenih država. So, um, um, I'm, I'm happy to have Andrew Vachtel here with us. Uh, many of you probably know about about his book, Making a Nation, Breaking a Nation, one of the most important contributions to the study of Yugoslavia and, and its disintegration. Um, um, Andrew published that book in 1998, um, uh, and um, at that time he basically created something that in, 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 in the scholarship of you know, people dealing with former Yugoslavia, we could call the cultural argument. Well, whereas most people were looking at political processes and there was a couple of important arguments about why Yugoslavia disintegrated. So people were, you know, mostly there was a nationalism paradigm and then there was also um, eco economics paradigm and, and why things didn't work uh, 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 and so on. And there was also, um, especially in the media, this whole idea about ancient hatred and so people always hated each other and uh, but there were some empires and then there was Tito to uh, to keep them not to, to 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 kill each other and then finally they got an opportunity to do so so uh, although it is a ridiculous uh, assumption it was very very popular in the 90s and uh, uh, apparently um, and had 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 a huge uh, influence on people and still has influence still uh, a huge influence on, on people's thinking about either former Yugoslavia or many other places where you have wars. Uh, it's always easy to say that this is this is how it was al always been and that the conflict and hatred always exist and, and so on. So Andrew uh, um, uh, constructed um, and basically research what was happening in, in the cultural sphere, what was happening in the educational sphere, uh, uh, what literature has to do with uh, with uh, making and breaking of a country. Um, we invited him tonight to discuss the conclusions uh, of, of his book. Uh, so in, in this conclusion, Andrew suggested that there are some disinte disintegrative processes uh, observable in Yugoslavia that could be seen uh, or detected in um, in the United States as well. Now, back then, that uh, seemed to be a very uh, very provocative thesis and a provocative argument. Uh, not only that people did not know much about Yugoslavia and and, and were judging uh, about what happened in the former Yugoslavia uh, by what they see seen on TV. Uh, to say that that place has something to do with the United States back then, obviously. Um, was was seen with a lot of suspicion now i'll read you a short paragraph uh basically the concluding words of this book and then we'll to then andrew will tell us what he thinks about his argument um almost 25 year, years uh, uh, uh 25 years later and uh, we'll then after a short um his short intervention me and alexander perisic will will talk with him we'll try to discuss this matter further so this is this is what Andrew wrote 23 or 24 years ago. It is clear that the United States is very very far from being Yugoslavia. Americans are still highly individualistic individualistic in their basic mentality and despite efforts from the left and right American culture remains resolutely multicultural. But at the same time, it needs to be recognized that American multiculturalist government sponsor initiatives that force people to identify on the basis of racial categories and some of the conservative response to both of these are slowly making the United States look more like Yugoslavia. Indeed, in some respects, I think that we can see Yugoslavia as an example of what might happen if what has been erroneously called the multicultural paradigm and the backlash against it, which has dominated American thinking for the past few decades, is not replaced by a revised version of the melting pot theory. If this is true, the very survival of the United States may depend on its ability to diffuse the pressures that ultimately destroyed Yugoslavia. By recognizing by recognizing where Yugoslavia went wrong, 
Americans may be able to head off their own failure, thereby ensuring that the United States' future does not look like Yugoslavia's present. Now, uh, obviously things have changed, and over the last, uh, um, last couple of years, especially during the Trump presidency, uh, and, and it's, it's very spectacular ending at Capitol Hill, many people started taking this suggestion uh, more seriously. Now we have Andrew Wachtel here to tell us how he sees his own arguments uh, first published, as I mentioned, almost 25 years ago. Thank you, Igor. Dobro uh, večer. Nice to be here. Um, well, so you can take any two things and you can compare them, obviously, and you can decide that what you want to focus on is what is similar or you can decide that you want to focus on what is different. Um, as, a, as a comparatist uh, in general, um, I tend to do both, that is, I don't do both at the same time, I tend to look at things and when everybody wants to see things being similar, then I try to look for differences and when everybody tries to see things being different, I try to look for similarities. So um, in the case of Yugoslavia, indeed, the, the claim in the United States, for whatever reasons people thought Yugoslavia fell apart, but, but the claim was um, this is a reasonably... Um, self-contained anomalous situation um, and it isn't likely to be very uh, it's not going to happen somewhere else in the same kind of way um, and then the other thing that people thought about Yugoslavia was and people I think like to think things this way they said well um, for whatever reasons we decide that Yugoslavia fell apart the important thing is that it did fall apart and if it did fall, fall apart, that means it was always inevitable that it would fall apart, right? So everybody knew, in quotation marks, that, that the fact that Yugoslavia collapsed so spectacularly, that meant that from the very beginning it was doomed to failure because people tend to think historically in very teleological sorts of ways. So if it ended up this way, that's the only way it could have ended up. Uh, and then they went back and they looked for all the evidence they could find that proved that it would never work, etc. So I got somewhat annoyed by that uh, approach, and I said, well, um, that seems like a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, why did people think it would work, right? Not, not why did people think it wouldn't work, but why did people think it would work, and what did they do to try to make it work? So I wrote primarily about what people did to try to make it work and why people thought it would work. And one of the quotations that I use in the book um, was one that uh, some guy in Serbia in like 1912 um, wrote that it is an, ev it, an inevitable law of history that small groups of people will amalgamate into larger groups of people. So he said, look at Germany, there were all these different small states, uh, and they all fought each other all the time, and now they have united and become a single state or not quite a single state, but, but a, a larger state. Um, look at Italy. You had all these little tiny kingdoms. Now they've amalgamated. They've become Italy. This is what will happen in Yugoslavia because this is the law of history. So I'm always very skeptical of laws of history. But in any case, right now in the 21st century, people would now say it is an, an inevitable law of history that larger groups will break down into smaller groups. Look at the Soviet Union, how it fell apart. Look at Yugoslavia, how it fell apart. Look at the United States, how it's falling apart. So this is this is the law of history. Well, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, as opposed to biology, where we can run the experiment a couple of thousand times or a couple of million times by breeding rats or mice or fruit flies and running through all sorts of experiments to see what will happen to them, um, the problem with political and social systems is we don't have enough lab laboratory rats. Um, we don't have very many cases. Um, so it's very easy to pick and choose. What we call cherry pick in English, right? Pick and choose the ones you want and say, well, this proves everything I've already said. All right. So, so what does Yugoslavia have to say about the United States? Or to what extent is the United States like or not like Yugoslavia? So the most obvious thing to say is that um, for those people who study 
nationalism and how nations are created, um, the overall understanding of how come I am an American is very different than what people thought how come I am a member of the country of Yugoslavia. So if, if I mean, if you remember the, the original name of the first Yugoslav kingdom, right, the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and uh, Slovenes, right? So you were a member of Yugoslavia because you were either a Croat, a, Slo a, a Slovene, or a Serb. Um, then as a member of that group, you join the country. So the country is cons constituted by these groups of people. Um, of course, if you happen to not be one of those, but still were a citizen of Yugoslavia, there were issues. But, but in principle, that's the concept. Um, in the United States, historically, the concept is I am an American because I'm an American. I'm not an American because I'm an Italian American and Italian Americans are a group of people and they have, are a constituent group of people in the United States. I'm an American because I'm an American, the end. And I'm an American not because I have some ethnic connection through some group of people that's in the country, but because I choose to be. Um, and I choose to be, I choose to believe in a certain set of mythologies that are primarily political in nature. Um, and kind of they are mythologies of the type anyone born in a log cabin can become president of the United States or it's a great place to get ahead or blah 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 whatever whatever various kinds of mythologies people believed about the United States which they are having trouble believing now but they did for a long time um, so those are very different ways you can understand being part of a country and the argument that I made in in the conclusion was that that um, that concept that America was consist or consisted of a bunch of individuals who didn't weren't members of the body politic because of their belonging to some um, sort of uh, larger group but because of their own individual familial choice um, that started to break down in the United States in the 1960s and 70s as various groups of people in the United States started demanding, rights as groups of people as opposed to rights as individuals so in principle you could always say every american has the right to the life liberty and the pursuit of happiness um, they have that right as an individual not because they are african-american and african-americans as a group should have that right but because they are an individual person again whether this is true or mythology doesn't that's not for the moment relevant the question is your conceptual idea of it so what I said was, um, for various reasons, most of them very well-meaning and most of them probably ultimately uh, not so terrible, um, people began to be more and more encouraged to see themselves more collectively as part of a group and then that group being part of and parcel of the country. Um, and what I said was there's nothing per se wrong with that way of looking at the world. The trouble with it is that it tends to produce a backlash from the larger group of people in the United States or anywhere else who say, well, if they get to have their rights as a collective group, then we should also have our rights as a collective group. Um, and that's what I was worried about then. And I said that the, the, the worry would be a right wing white led backlash against um, those kinds of identity politics in the United States um, that would be based specifically on demanding rights for the majority group that they never thought they had or they never articulated as rights. They, they probably always thought they had them, but they never articulated them. Um, and, un and unfortunately, that is exactly, I think, what we have seen happening in the last five years very, very clearly in the United States and, and maybe the last year even more clearly um, this idea that, um, well, if those people are going to demand their rights, whatever that means, then we're going to demand our rights. Um, and then you go from being a country where democracy means the protection of minorities against potential majorities to the other way around, which is the protection of the majority against, or the plurality against everybody else. Um, so in that respect, the United States 
I think is becoming more like Yugoslavia. People think of themselves more frequently now as parts of collectivities, and they think of those collectivities as having rights that are separate from the rights of individual people or, or added on to those amalgamated together. Um, what's really different about the United States, of course, is that those collectivities are not geographically or generally not geographically delimited. So the one huge advantage of, for, for the purposes of having a multinational, multicultural state in the United States is the way the United States was formed was by killing off the local population first. So before we brought in all sorts of groups of immigrants, we killed everybody who lived there um, to some extent on purpose, to some extent by accident. Um, and as a result, the groups of people that came aren't people who said, we've always been here, right? So as opposed to Croats who could say, we've been here since the fifth century or whatever, and this land belongs to us, at least they could try to say that, or Albanians who could say, we've been here since before them and that land belongs to us. In the United States, those, those geographical boundaries don't map onto these sort of collectivities. And so insofar as one thinks that the United States looks more like Yugoslavia than it used to, and therefore is more um, potentially able to fracture along these kinds of lines, um, the, the counter argument would be, well, if there's no geographical way those lines can fracture, if, if there's you know, just as many people, or it's the same percentage of people in Oregon and in Vermont and in Texas who think the same thing, but there's another equally large percentage in those same places who think something else, um, then it's very difficult for those things to form the kinds of cleavages that can lead to a political um, change in the way the place is constituted. And of course, at the same time, the, you know, the, the bottom line with all these things from my perspective is things will fall apart if people no longer have some kind of coherent narrative about their country that that they can hang on to. So as I said, I mean, it, a lot of the mythology of the United States was definitely blah, 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 but people actually believed it. Um, and that belief is what keeps things together. When that belief disappears, then what's left to hold on to. Then people look for other sorts of ways of organizing themselves if, if the mythologies that they believed in no longer hold. Um, and so that's a question of whether the mythologies that held the United States together still work. Um, you know, it's been proven in quotation marks by various sociologists that, that most of the mythologies of, you know, America is the best place to get ahead in the world are all untrue at this point. Um, and of course, they may have been untrue for quite some time, but when people begin to actually realize they're untrue, that's when real serious problems begin. Um, so, so again, is the United States like Yugoslavia? Well, it's more like Yugoslavia than it was, um, but it's less like Yugoslavia than Yugoslavia was. Um, so that leaves you in a kind of ambiguous position. It leaves you in a position where you say, um, we don't want to keep going down this road, right? This is a bad road to go down. Um, because the outcomes of or the what what ends up happening if you keep going down this road doesn't look very good. But unfortunately, once you start heading down that road, it's often a pretty tough road to get off of. Um, so I'm not in the crystal ball gazing predict, prediction world. Um, Paris and then suddenly wasn't a very well functioning place and then suddenly wasn't a place at all. Um, you see some worrying parallels, and I think that what I wrote in 1998, seeing worrying parallels, I see more worrying parallels now. Um, I think a, a good quote to end, there's a famous quote from a character in um, one of the Hemingway novels about how someone goes bankrupt, and he says they went bankrupt slowly and then precipitously. Um, so that's the problem, is that you kind of, the, the path down or the, the path to hell is a very slow path down at first, um, but at some point it becomes a very fast path down. And once you're on the fast path down, getting off the fast path is pretty tough. So 
there's not, the, 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 the path down, the slow path down could last for a very, very, very long time. And there's no guarantee that just because you got on it, you will end up someplace. But if you're on it, you best get off it. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you for coming, first of all, and, and thank you for this talk. Um, where to begin? <laughs> okay, I, uh, there's so many, there's so many things to discuss and so many questions. Um, the first one, maybe I'd like to start with a, with a general one, and that's with this idea of two multiculturalisms, or that there was a multiculturalism in the U.S. that worked, at least somewhat, until the 70s. But then in the conclusion, you also, I mean, you say that there, there is a significant group of people that it didn't work for, right? African-Americans. And so I guess my question is, um, yeah, wh what, what do we do with the racial problem in the US in the sense that now, you know, we're having all of these cultural wars that are related to critical race theory, teaching of slavery and race in schools and so to what extent is this, like you're saying, like a new thing? And to what extent is this really, you know, a longer issue? All right, so, I mean, those are, to me, those are two somewhat separate questions. So, so how did U.S. multiculturalism work, right, until the 70s? So there was a kind of a deal in the United States, which, is, which as I wrote, does, did not hold for African-Americans, but held for most everybody else. And the deal was, you come to the United States from wherever you come from, and we hate you, by definition, because you're an immigrant and we don't like immigrants. And the United States is, I mean, on the one hand, it's always been a welcoming country for immigrants in the, in the sense that they allowed them to be exploited and work and then eventually make something of themselves. Um, they didn't just kill them or something, right? So in that respect, it was welcoming. Um, and each new generation of immigrants disliked the next generation once they became established. So, you know, British Americans and Irish Americans, or I British Americans came and then Irish Americans came in 1848 and the British hate, hated the Irish. But then they decided the Irish weren't so bad when the Germans came because they hated the Germans more. And then the British and the Irish could hate the Germans. And then the, then the, the Germans and the British, they, then the Germans and the British and Irish could hate the Jews and the Italians because they were the new groups. And so each generation hated the next group. But the deal was that, and it was never a written down deal, it was kind of an unspoken deal, that each of these groups of people that came was allowed to keep a certain percentage of their original culture or their original ways of being as long as they were willing to kind of assimilate to the larger national narrative and and the larger national narrative was willing to accommodate certain pieces of this new group of people that came so it might be that they took like you know Amer Jews came from Poland and suddenly American language had you know a hundred words from Yiddish that everybody uses, or at least in New York, they use them. Um, and, and so you felt, you know, okay, I had to give up this or that and the other thing. Um, I can't dress the way I dressed in Poland anymore, but, um, but I still can, at home, I can do whatever I want. And, and, my, and, the, and the new culture has accommodated to some extent, right? It's, it's, it's brought something in of me to that culture. So I give up a lot, but I get something and the culture expands. So that was the, that was the deal. And even with African Americans, oh, and, and and eventually, if I'm willing to dress like everybody else and more or less talk like everybody else, eventually no one will notice me anymore as an immigrant. Um, it takes a while in the U.S. historically, but but after a generation or two, nobody cared that you were a German American, and nobody cared that you were Italian American, and nobody cared even that you were Jewish American. You know, there's at first there's huge prejudice, there's quotas, and then there aren't anymore. So with African-Americans, on the one hand, the cultural narrative did sort of accommodate a fair amount of African-American culture um, and continues to do so, but it never accommodated actual African-American people, right? So they simply weren't allowed to assimilate into the overall society and be treated, quotes, like everybody else, the way Italian-Americans or German-Americans or Jewish-Americans or now Laotian-Americans are. Um, 
and that's a big problem. Um, and that that sort of anomaly, first the anomaly of how they got there in the first place is the only group that didn't come of their own volition, but was forced to come. And then the only group that was not allowed to assimilate um, creates a huge tension in the country. And that huge tension was always present, um, but able to be ignored. Um, well, able to be ignored by everybody else. It was clearly not ignored by African Americans who couldn't ignore it because they had to live it. Um, but was able to be ignored. And then as the civil rights movement got underway in the 60s, for at least 40 years, most Americans could say to themselves, oh, it's getting better. You know, they're, they're going to be assimilated. It, it'll, it'll take some time like it did for everybody else, but ultimately they will be assimilated. That clearly hasn't happened. And by this point, it clearly isn't going to happen. Um, and that creates a sort of hole in the narrative, and it's not clear to what extent the narrative can recover from that hole, because narratives don't like holes, um, and somehow you need to fill the hole. And so now you have this split between, on the one hand, a group of people in the larger culture who say, we have a big problem here, and then another group that keeps wanting to paper over the problem and pretend there is no problem. And that tension is, is a huge potential problem. It's not a similar problem to anything that happened in Yugoslavia. That's just, it's just a completely anomalous problem um, that specifically relates to the United States. Right, and, and, and I mean, just to add to that, like you were saying, I mean, progressively, Italians were allowed to assimilate, you know, Germans, um, Jews, but, or um, they became white, <laughs> but also when they started supporting white supremacy. In other words, well, some did and some didn't. I mean, it, it depends where. I mean, again, having grown up in a, in a Jewish American background, I wouldn't say Jews supported Ameri white supremacy in any kind of direct way. They simply refused to recognize the problem right. of African Americans. No, I, I mean, in, in when they um, were willing to become white in the way. Sure, they were willing. They were willing to become white, knowing that uh, not everybody could do it, right. or or not recognizing, not caring that everybody right. couldn't do it. Um, but yeah, being becoming white is is a funny. Th I mean, a funny thing to say because, um, let's say, Japanese Americans also could become white, although they obviously. I mean, it's not simply a question of looking the same, right? So Italian, you can't tell that someone's Italian American by looking at them. Um, you, you can tell someone is Asian American by looking at them, but that didn't prevent them bec from becoming white to a great extent. So it's, and it, if, even, even in the black community, as you know, I mean, African immigrants have had an easier, or Caribbean immigrants have had an easier time becoming right. white than African Americans. Um, so it's not even only a question of, of skin color. Um, it's just, I mean, it's, it's the, I mean, everybody knows at this point in the United States, it's the single biggest issue in the country, and there's no obvious good solution to the to the issue, but it's a kind of bracket. I mean, from the point of the connection to Yugoslavia, it's just a completely anomalous, off the page problem. I mean, the other problems may be similar. That problem is not similar. I mean, maybe to Albania. I suppose maybe you could say to Albanians who simply were not Slavs, but like we don't. Put, I don't think I don't want to push it too no, far. No, but I, I I do see a similarity, and maybe. I mean, Maybe you don't. Maybe you'll correct me if I'm wrong. That's why I was um, mentioning the um, the current cultural wars around critical race theory because it is ultimately about how you tell and teach history, right? Which actually is a very relevant <laughs> topic right now. I mean, obviously we're talking about very different histories. Sure. I mean, but the but the biggest problem here is not simply th there isn't any good way to bring to bridge the gap of that history. Either you have to agree that essentially we have to make this huge hole in the narrative and, and recognize there's this huge hole, or you don't want to agree with that. And once you do agree with that, then that opens up the door to lots of other holes. Right? And the narrative, a narrative is always a narrative because it holds together um, as a kind of coherent set of theses. Once you sort of blow a big hole in the side of it, it's like it's like you know when the Titanic runs into an iceberg. It's not it's not that there's, you know, that little hole in the in the Titanic is enough to sink the whole ship. Right? So that's maybe a, a good analogy of this. 
it's 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 interesting when we talk about narratives and uh i live then and i guess you were there in you know 2008 and especially um uh, in chicago there was this whole celebration of course of obama winning you know the elections and uh the the i remember still the cover of new york times like basically you know welcome to the post-racial america so there was a whole idea about moving beyond uh race because finally there is a, a black president uh and i think the disappointment with the obama administration and the fact that this was this did not happen did not deliver there was no new new post-racial uh, narrative is also what's fueling a lot of anger uh the the change was cosmetics in this respect it was more of a Franz Fanon, you know, uh, white mask. Uh, you got the black president, but actually this is the guy who has, has a, a very different class, uh, class standing and who could not and did not do anything to actually change the system. So the, the, uh, um, the question, of course, is now uh, bringing us all the way to, to Biden saying uh, this is not who we are. And I think that uh, that uh, by commenting the, the the riots at Capitol Hill, uh, I think uh, uh, you refer to this narrative b b because when you say this is not who we are, it's people of Biden's generation were referring to that old m melting pot theory that actually we are those who are inclusive and welcoming and so on and not these other guys. So my c c question is, uh, as you say here, we need something. You don't say we need, you say without actually having a, some another version of melting pot theory, uh, this country will have huge problems of uh, politically surviving or socially surviving and so on. The, it seems to me uh, now that, um, that not so many people are actually giving us any kind of giving us, giving them, giving to the Americans any kind of new narrative. It seems that fracture is open it's obvious that the race problem won't be solved by affirmative action, won't be solved even by teaching history, won't be solved by all these symbolic type of gestures, uh, removing statutes, uh, renaming places. This is not going to be solved by this. And obviously, wh uh, white nationalists um, are not going to go away. Um, in this respect, of course, this is not a parallel comparison, but at the end of 80s, uh, people struggled uh, to give a new narrative to Yugoslavia. One of them was Predrag Matvejevic, and we published actually his, his attempt uh, to, to uh, redefine Yugoslavism. And he published a book called Yugoslavism Today. We published it in our co common library. And you can see that he tried to give, give it a, a, a new turn. Uh, okay, no Yugoslavism of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. That's not the Yugoslavism we want. That's unitarism. We don't want the unitarism. But this is no longer something that was promoted kind of socialist Yugoslavism, a multinational, plurinational Yugoslavia. Okay, uh, yes, we respect absolute rights of everyone, but there should be some common denominator that we all somehow feel Yugoslavs, even if we are not South Slavs. So he was pretty much aware of that, especially because of Albanians and Hungarians and people who did not feel belonging to the country. And he really tried. Uh, the problem was that the, the narrative was get, getting more complex, uh, extraordinary complex. You need to have political mythology, you need simple narratives. His narrative required really a lot of kind of um, a commitment to a very sophisticated theory of what Yugoslavia should be and what, what does it mean to be a Yugoslav. At least it was a noble attempt. People read it. It was a best-selling book, like some other nationalist book. It was a best-selling book, but didn't work. Now, my question is, how to get to that narrative? Well, so there, there, in, in, <coughs> in addition give to... Give an easy question. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, look, in addition to... Th there's, there's times when you need narratives more than other times. So if I were running the United States, which I'm not... Um, I don't think I would spend my time trying to come up with a better, newer narrative of what makes us all Americans. I would try to make the country function because the, the two things go together, right? So people get more and more worried about narratives about who we are, especially when things don't function very well, right? So 
what would be easier to solve? A kind of ideological, new creation of an ideological concept of Americanness or making the political, making the economic system work for more people, right? Um, if, if the political system and the economic system work for more people, then you have maybe you're by yourself some time for coming up with this narrative. A narrative by itself, I mean, I think a narrative is extremely important. That's, that's what I said about Yugoslavia. But a narrative on its own doesn't, doesn't cut it, right? A narrative ha is part of, it's embedded in an overall, the best thing to do is try to separate them out, right? And, and which is easier to solve first or, right? So it's hard to say. I mean, as a cultural historian, of course, my tendency is to think that culture is the most important thing. Political historian would think politics is the most important thing. Economic historian thinks economics are the most important thing. In reality, all of these things are important, right? So, you know, is it is it possible to create a more... Um, equitable distribution of wealth in the United States. Yeah, it's possible. Um, are people going to do it? Well, that's a different question. Is it easier to create a more equitable distribution of wealth by fixing the taxation system, let's say, than coming up with a new narrative of what it means to be American that would somehow close this gaping hole in the, in the narrative? Well, come closing that gaping hole in the narrative is going to be pretty damn tough. Um, so... If I'm running the country, I try to fix the tax system and get more people feeling that they're that things are going in the right direction. So I have some time to figure out how I'm going to create a new narrative that works, um, and it doesn't produce the kind of cultural backlash. Doesn't continue to feed this cultural backlash, which is currently being fed by this whole bad combination of things. Um, because I don't know what I mean. The, the American narratives were so tied up to prosperity and progress and prosperity is clearly not happening for a very decent chunk of the population, not just the sort of um, obvious deplorables in quotation marks, but, but lots of other people too. And, you know, the people still believe in progress is a little hard to believe, but they still do. Americans do. Americans are the most um, optimistically you know, mythologizing progress people in the world, but that's beginning to fray as well. So, so you know, those are the real myths of the United States, not even the everybody is, you know, welcome and, and we all love everybody, but this idea that you can get ahead economically, socially, um, if you work hard enough. That's the, that's the single biggest hole right now, I think. Well, really, it's a, it's a belief in capitalism, right? That also does start to disintegrate more and more. Well, capitalism, call, I mean, I'm not sure what the, what you mean, capital, it's not really a belief in capitalism in the sense that capitalism, I mean, nobody really understood who believed, I mean, the people who believed that, like, if you work hard, you'll get ahead, that wasn't exactly connected to capitalism, at least not in the sense of, like, who controls capital, it was always understood that there would be rich people who would be much more ahead than you, right? There was some system that allowed you in that world, the economic world that was created to supposedly do well. Although no one ever actually looked at the statistics and asked whether, what percentage of people were really doing well. Um, so, I mean, again, there's, there's a whole set of things simultaneously and to some extent, you, you can't you can't solve every problem at the same time. That's that's what I would say. So I'm not sure. I mean, is there a great ideologue, you know, of future Americanness out there? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who he or she is. Um, if there is, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people who think they are such ideologues. But is there anybody who has the cachet and the social capital to and and in a in a Facebook fragmented world that anybody that lots of people would listen to um, across a big spectrum tough to do well and yet what is interesting in the United States is that so in the midst of this you know rising rift also for instance um, you know a, a big number of Millennials identified themselves as socialists 
and what they mean by social is we can get into right but anyways the word the word <laughs> is is out right and is circulating particularly among a younger generation right so the dsa the democratic socialists of america um are the largest they've ever been we've had the bernie sanders campaign um i mean it didn't you know uh, it didn't go as far as it could have but and i guess i'm just wondering do you see how does that fit into what we've been talking about do you see any potential in there or so again i'm not a, i'm not a crystal ball gazer i mean what what we certainly see is that there's a generational um a very strong generational rift in the united states between you know people over the age of 60 um and people that that sort of between that and people under the age of 30 if you look at their voting patterns and and their religious patterns and whatever they're extremely different um I mean, it's not the first time there's been a generational rift in society. Um, the question is, is you know, does that new generation have a spokesperson or a, a, a an ideological, not not just this kind of inchoate, well, the capitalist system, however it worked, doesn't work for me anymore, so I want something else, and the only word I can think of is socialism. Um, you know, is there is there a, an actual ideology there, or is it just a, a sort of, well, I don't whatever they called it before. That's not good, and that's not good, and I want something else. But what it is that I really want, I don't know what I really want. So someone has to crystallize what it is they really want, and will po politicians come along who will try? Sure. Um, and is there a reasonable chance that that group of people can break certain kinds of ideological log jams? Yes, there is. Um, and is it good that a certain group of people are choosing to kill themselves who happen to be older and different from that group? Yeah, it's probably great. I mean, more of them that kill themselves, the better um, from that perspective. But is that going to happen fast enough to prevent everything from blowing up? That's, that's the $64,000 question. OK, so, so maybe we can now invite our audience uh, to to react to to what's been said and uh, some of you have some experience of the United States some don't but have experience of uh, Yugoslavia and some of you of post Yugoslav situation so go ahead Hi. Um, okay, so I would love to uh, go back to the first thing that you said about um, an um, individual that can um, choose for himself, and that individuals became uh, individuals came into some groups. And I was wondering about um, Jose Ortega and Gasset that he uh, Gasset that he have a theory about a mass man, and I was wondering if. Um, I wrote the question down so I can remember. Um, if the revolt of the masses, if, the, uh, if a man is a mass, does the man become an elite because uh, we have to protect the majority? And does the majority become then a mass? I was wondering if there's like, that we can change the theory because um, I s heard you said that uh, ma majorities they have to be protected. They feel like they have to be protected. And I was wondering if then they become the, m the lead or does what does happen, wh what happens with the theory? I, I mean, when you say elite, th the definition of an elite, it, it can't be a mass, right? I mean, that's the, the definition of an elite is it's a smallish group of people separate from others. So the mass can be uh, or the, the mass of people can can constitute itself in various kinds of ways um or it or it can i mean people tend to sort of clump lots of ideological things together to create these kinds of masses which 
can be organized in various sorts of ways. I mean, there's a great essay, I don't remember what it's called, by George Orwell, um, who is complaining about why he hates socialists um, and basically says, well, the problem with socialists is not their economic ideas. It's that if you want to be a socialist, you also have to be a vegetarian and you have to be this and you have to be that and you have to be these all, you know, this whole thing comes for the ride and you're not allowed to say, well, I, I'm willing, to, I want to be an economic socialist, but I want to be a sort of something else, right? Everything comes as part of a package, right? That's traditionally what the United States has not been, right? The United States has not officially sort of created these kinds of like clumps of things that all had to go together. But as people become more communitarian, they do tend to do that. So, you know, you might have had people in the past who were, I mean, certainly in terms of voting behavior, you had it. People who voted for Democratic candidates on be anti-abortion, pro-guns, um, you know, anti-vax. You can't be pro-vax and and, and pro-gun, those, those two things don't go together. And, and they're like, but why not? In, in principle, there's no reason they couldn't go together, but they don't go together, right? People take their ideology as a clump as opposed to making decisions on a, on a kind of point-by-point -point basis. At least that's the claim, is that more people are getting more sort of homogenized. So they become more of a mass because the mass, there's fewer potential sort of rifts inside the mass, right? And that becomes politically somewhat, or can become politically somewhat dangerous, especially in a, in a system that's, organized. I mean, in a system like a European system where you have 37 political parties and they have to coalition govern anyway, maybe that's not so terrible. In the United States with a two-party system, that becomes a little more problematic because you have to choose one side or the other side. And then as the sides get more rigid, there's fewer places where they can work together and then they just start butting heads and nothing gets done. Thanks. Do we have any other questions, comments? Later on, yeah. The, the of course, in the uh, in the era, especially the '90s and so on, it was almost uh, later on. It was almost fashionable to criticize multiculturalism, you know, because it's like, oh, you get that food and this food, and it's it's all multiculti as we say it here and so on. Uh, now, what? Or, for instance, Zizi could say multiculturalism is inverse racism. Is just I, I tell you, oh, it's so wonderful. Your culture is wonderful, but just stay there in your culture, in your group. You know, don't ask for more, more, more than this. And I like to go to a, to a restaurant and I like to travel the world, but actually, I don't want your culture to contaminate me. And also, from basically saying you put yourself as mostly that that meant white as a universal whereas other people have cultures yeah? so they have their culture and they're, they're totally totally determined by their culture whereas emancipated mostly white uh, person uh, could could have an universal views uh, now on the other hand if you go back to to to, to the theories and and philosophers who were trying to to, to actually create some 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 say, a coherent narrative such as Charles Taylor or Will Kimlicka about multicultural society, they came from, from, from liberal background where the question of justice was the most important one. And they would come and say, okay, yes, there was a, a melting pot theory, but not that it only, it didn't work for certain races, but it didn't work also for people for whom their culture is important, yeah? Uh, and if you are growing up in a family where they speak, as you mentioned, Yiddish, and they tell you you can't speak Yiddish any longer, that, that, that hurts. Of course, you explain the mechanism. The mechanism was that economically you'll be better off than your, uh, 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 than your grandparents or whatever back in Poland or, 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 and so on. And that it had to do something with, with prosperity, individual, family prosperity, and so on. So you can give up on, on your little language, no, no problem with that. So they were said, but you know, for many groups, this really 
this hurt their, their feelings, so we should do something. And um, we should allow people to express their culture more freely and so on. Also, socially, we should allow for affirmative action. You know, we should get into universities uh, more African Americans, uh, Asian Americans, and so on, to reflect actually uh, uh, the society. And the idea was that by using the mechanism of modern state, you're going to include people into this prosperity. Yeah. And that's yeah. that's exactly the what I mean. Again, it's a great idea, and it absolutely leads to or has led to the opposite, exact opposite effect, which is the demand on the part of the majoritarian mm -hmm. group for their rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I obviously mean, multiculturalists did not think they should think about these major majority right, groups because they majority, didn't think they should think yeah. about anything, but yeah. but but the fact was they should have thought about that. I mean, that that's exactly the problem. Uh, yeah, well, this is this is of course political problem. What they were trying to to they try to fix the problem and I mean liberals like Will Kimlicka would say but this is only temporarily because they were aware that you might put people into group and basically essentialize them and not allow them to get out of this cultural environment and of course we, we all know that ethnic and national groups, diaspora groups could be very undemocratic and not allowing their members to mix and whatever because they then lose this cultural capital or the, uh, uh, for which they get certain rights so they wanted to fix this in order to have this great liberal society in which er, 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 everyone is happy. Uh, uh, this, this thing that uh, of endangered majority uh, obviously was starting rolling and you had this in mind and you wrote ab about that. Uh, um, and this is, this is uh, the, the, the whole, uh, the problem is of course, you can't solve all these problems. If you want to please the, the majority, you know, you, you will never so so solve this problem. The, the, the situation in which we are now is that you have a politicization of majority so supposed problem and mobilization, political mobilization on their side. But on the other hand, you have also still the problem that you, in a way, have to kind of address at this level of acknowledging, uh, 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 acknowledging group identities. Um, now, and, and to adding to this, one thing that is missing is, of course, class. So when Black Panthers were around, they were not only fi fighting for group identity, they were fighting for different society. Yeah, And this problem you can't solve only with taxation, although that would be at least some some step ahead of progressive taxation and, and distribution of money uh, uh, and, and trying to make some kind of a welfare state out of this enormously rich place as in the United States. So it seems that there are so many elements. Of course, we don't expect you to solve them now. I hope not. <laughs> That, that are today with us that do create this type of uh, uh, confusion, not only on part of us who, are, who do not live there now, uh, 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 but, but also obviously in, in the States. Look, I mean, whenever we talk about fixing a problem, I think the first thing you, you that, that a, a um, sober-minded person should do is ask, is this really a problem that needs to be solved, right? So... I personally do not think the um, the loss of sort of culture on the part of Hmong Americans or um, uh, transgender one-legged women is a problem that needs to be solved because because the in solving the problem you create a massively bigger problem and you don't solve you do you don't solve the first problem and you create an enormous other problem. So then you should ask yourself, is this a problem A, I could solve? I mean, if you say African-Americans is a problem that has to be solved, right? Somehow it has to be solved because this is a large group of people in society for a really long period of time that simply sit as a kind of unassimilatable and unsolvable problem that just festers and festers and festers, right? Is... Do you have to, is, 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 should you solve that problem or should you solve the problem of whether, you know, Yiddish speakers have to give up Yiddish or not or should be allowed to speak Yiddish, write, write their, um, you know, New York driver's license exam in Yiddish? Well, you know, that's not really a problem you had to solve. And, and in solving it and in saying, okay, they could have bilingual schools for this and, and write your voter IDs or write voter rolls in that. You created a whole set of other problems that you didn't really have to create, and you didn't solve the first problem. 
So to me, I, I you know, Charles Taylor is a very smart guy, obviously. But to me, Charles Taylor is a big problem because you you put out, you're you're essentially creating endless numbers of problems without solving any problems and essentially making all the existing problems worse. Well, um, in the in in Greek society, they made them drink hemlock when they did that. In the United States, we let them retire and 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 write books. So. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, because my question is related to international relations theory and international studies, uh, because uh, recently we had an attempt by a group of scholars uh, called Yugosplaining the World, uh, made by uh, authors from uh, who now work in the United States and are part of this uh, post Yugoslav diaspora. Uh, by Jelena Subotic, Srdjan Vucetic, and uh, Aida Hozic, for example, uh, and others who made a group uh, uh, statement on that there is a possibility to explain the processes in the world by some exa examples of the Yugoslav experience. And it is, I think, close to this idea of tonight's discussion. Uh, but uh, b because in a globalized uh, world and globalized world politics, uh, it's uh, usually the reversed ideas that are usually transferred from the uh, academic communities, from the Anglo-Saxon community, and it's called the Western uh, International Relations Theory, for example. And this is a reversed attempt, but uh, it is um, usually mostly cultural, uh, and uh, it is probably the need of these uh, authors who are trying to say that uh, some processes are similar, but uh, to what degree, in your opinion, is possible to to have certain theory that can universally explain these things? And uh, I mean, it's a, it's an intellectual attempt, and uh, it probably does justice to this region in which we live here. And uh, is it possible, for for example, to explain the process in the United States by the experience of Yugoslavia? And to what degree? And uh, is it possible to have, let's say, a global international relations theory, or should we just uh, stick to certain concepts which are maybe more universally accepted? I just want to throw this uh, to the discussion and maybe to try to uh, juxtapose this uh, idea by these scholars to your theory from 25 years ago. Thank you. So I think it's it's a great question. I mean. You know the dream. The dream of the social sciences has always been to be a science. Um, they they would love to be physics um, or chemistry, um, and unfortunately, it doesn't usually work very well um, because those things that are universal are so obvious that they're boring, and those things, everything else is too complicated to fit into your universal theory. So you just declare it a, a sort of, you know, anomaly. Um, and the problem is, as I said, there, there, there simply aren't enough lab rats to test your theory, right? So, so to say, oh, the United States, it looks like Yugoslavia. Okay. Yeah. I mean, certain things about the United States look like Yugoslavia. Are they the most important things? Um, does the fact that they look like Yugoslavia mean that this is just the United States is just Yugoslavia with a 10 year lag time or a 20 year lag time or a 30 year lag time. And we will inevitably end up like X. I mean, you know, Marx, Marx, Marx had a theory of history that said everybody was going to end up in the same place at some point. Um, maybe it will turn out to be right. Who knows? Um, it hasn't hasn't worked out too well yet. Um, but just because it hasn't worked out yet doesn't mean it won't work out in the future. Um, so to me, I'm, I'm not a big fan of universal theories. Um, I can see things, as I said, I, I see things that are similar and I can point them out and I can say, maybe we don't want to be similar in that way. Maybe we want to sort of avoid being similar or we might want to be similar to 
someplace. But does that does that is that enough to create a kind of universal theory? I I, I don't. You know, as I said, when when in 1912, it was obvious to this guy in Serbia that small groups of people would amalgamate into larger groups. It was like completely and totally obvious, and he he, I'm sure, was sure that he had seen enough fruit flies to say that's what was going to happen, um, and therefore he could say that was going to happen in Yugoslavia, and it did happen in Yugoslavia. And he, I'm sure, said, "See how smart I am? I see a universal theory. This is great." And now, it's easy to look and say large groups of people will will break down into smaller ones. You know, nuclear nu- nuclear fission will happen and they will, these unstable uranium atoms will break up into smaller states. I mean, again, I can think of very specific contexts why, let's say, in Europe now, breaking up into smaller states is a logical thing to happen because of the way the EU works and because of the way NATO works and blah, blah. But those are contingent things. They don't, they're not going to be here forever. So for now, it seems like this is a pretty obvious thing that bigger groups will break into smaller ones. But then there's some limit to, to, to that. I mean, you know, to say, oh, we're going to become independent Northern Cyprus and independent Cyprus and independent Montenegro and independent um, Bosnia and Serbia and and then I say no, but okay, then I'm going to become independent my block and independent Igor's block. At some point, you get to the point where it's no, okay, fine. You can't you can't keep getting smaller. There's there's going to be some kind of countervailing pressure that causes people not to not to be able to be successful being smaller, right? And then all suddenly the rules will change and everybody say oh. There's a new universal theory. So again, I'm not sure I like universal theories. They're they're too there's not there's too many contexts and too many contingencies and not enough fruit flies to make universal theories for politics from to my mind. But I don't I mean I'm not a political scientist. I've always found political science to be somewhat of a joke, but whatever. For me, yes, but but again, here I have two people with PhDs in political science, so so. Uh, absolutely no, not. I'm much no. closer to you. I'm a comparatist. Ah, okay. I have a background in comparatism. Okay, so sorry. Department so of they run it. Yeah, you run it. God forbid. Invited you here. God forbid. Now we got insulted. For so we're, we're we're like now this is like broken. this is like the amateur gynecologist <laughs> in Monty <laughs> Python. So. <laughs> All right. So that's that's that 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 but question that of course is not only because i think everybody's worried about that uh, the problem with with uh, the the argument the nationalist argument that obviously um was politically very very strong at the end of the cold war and during the breakup of yugoslavia was that the rule or, of history is not to have multinational countries look at austria hungary it doesn't exist anymore look at here what we need is our country national country where we are going to be absolute majority and so of course then in yugoslavia they use all the good recipes to do it so killing people uh, uh, expelling them and so on and and assimilating any differences that exist now 30 years later you know we see where we are yeah the problem is that they believed at the end of socialism that socialism was bringing this universal perspective coming from from communist manifesto you know all 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 struggles were class struggles and that's that's the universal law and that we're gonna get eventually uh, uh to socialism and was also in a way opening up uh space for these multinational countries soviet union socialist yugoslavia and so on it was logical the whole idea of going back to your group and then creating uh instruments was extraordinarily strong what happened is like 10 years later on, even people here realize that 20, 30, that national state doesn't count much in today's world. That many multinational corporations are much stronger than, than, than states. That you are indebted, that you are actually dependent. You are being independent, it literally comes to this waving flags, nothing else. And you can send your team to the Olympics and, and so on. And people tend to buy it still. But in the terms of kind of national sovereignty for which we people went to kill each other and uh, to get killed, uh, that that's no longer there. And like almost no country in the in the world could say that it's completely independent, although some countries obviously have some instruments to prove it, such as big countries. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, 
we we are also in this crisis and this 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 makes some people believe for instance in scotland and it's a generational thing that the whole old generation britishness and being proud of the you know kings and queens and the empire and all these all this stuff people don't buy it so they go for a, for an option yeah we want our national state in order in a way to have a more democratic state or the state that will protect their basic rights because obviously they feel that this is not happening and the younger people are obviously by they they are going to vote for independence whereas the the older all older generation is dying is dying out at the same time independence does not mean anything uh it seems that in some places and this is again a question for you for, for the audience uh you some people still believe that exit from the previously existing state especially if it's territorial it's possible in the united states now we discuss it and you had some arguments that yeah that also might happen and you know there are texans but there are californians who want to uh, uh to to leave there are people in london who believes that the london should stay in the eu and the england go away and so on now they believe that they might solve some of the most important questions which is as i said democracy uh and part participation in the united states the impression is like you can't get out of that it's more of a, i could see it now uh not that it's it's a crisis of a federal system for sure but it's not so much territorial as it is a, a, a question of social fragmentation that it's almost now impossible to heal now the question for you uh is uh do you still believe that nation state has some future or we are in a, some kind of post-national phase that is still not determined uh, still we don't know where we are going and in what kind of forms so i don't know i guess the the, the always the answer is be careful what you wish for because you might get it right so you know okay it's easy to see what the flaws of a system are um it's a little harder to say oh okay so we'll get out of that system and we'll get into some new system that will it's it, it's it's always seems like it should be better somewhere else in some other system um rarely does it turn out to be significantly better because most of the problems aren't problems that are solvable by this particular means right so i mean i suspect the nation state looks pretty good if you're in norway i mean if you're a norwegian the, the nation state concept sounds kind of good no one invades us because nation states don't aren't allowed to invade each other anymore and we have lots of money and we're more or less homogeneous even if we don't like those southern norwegians and maybe the, the western norwegians but but basically we're kind of norwegians um nation state is great who would want to change it um people who are in places where they don't like what's going on then they start looking around for solutions you live in texas and you say okay we would be better off as a as the the, the united state of texas um well, it could solve some problems, um, p potentially, probably create lots of other problems. Um, could it work, let's say? Well, there's no mechanism for it to happen. Um, I could look, I, I mean, it has. It, it has, in, it, yes, in the U.S. absolutely has. Um, but if we look at the example of France, Right, France is very attached to its republicanism and the idea of an abstract citizen, right, which cannot be marked by race, gender, sexuality. And France loves being in a culture war <laughs> with the US and criticizing US multiculturalism. Um, they, you know, historically are very against affirmative action or any kind of um, racial identification or asking people to identify for race. And yet, um, you know, the Front National is growing and is support for Marine Le Pen, right? And so not to the extent in the U.S., but in other words, the the sort of white, maybe not majority still in the France, but it's still retaliating. <laughs> yes, um, because de facto, France has created, I mean, though it doesn't admit it on in any open forum, it it failed to, to it, I mean, it failed to live up to its side of the deal, right? So I mean, in in the U.S., 
again, the, the deal in the U.S., except for African Americans, worked reasonably well. I mean, yes, you had to give up speaking Yiddish in public because you were looked down upon at home. You, know, you didn't have to give it up. Um, was that a price to pay? Was that a reasonable price to pay for having a functioning society? Yeah, I think that's a perfectly reasonable price to do what they want at home. You don't force them, like in France, to, to, to identify as French. I don't, the United States never cared whether you identified as an American or you didn't identify. Nobody ever asked. Um, you could identify however you wanted to identify in private. In public, you, didn't, you weren't forced to say anything. But you could. I mean, in the United States, you know, you can wear a veil or a hijab or whatever. Nobody says. But in principle, you can. Right, so in France, this is taken to a much larger level. You become French, fully French, and we accept you. And for some people, actually, I mean, the amazing thing always to Americans is how well it worked for, let's say, how French was, France was less racist towards blacks than the United States. So it wasn't that it was unracist, but in principle, French colonial blacks were more accepted than Africa's perfectly good French people. They had their last name of whatever, I mean, all these Russian emigres who came after, you know, 1918, they became perfectly happy French people, and the French were perfectly happy to accept them. But they weren't happy to accept, and I mean, the, the Arabs might have said, we're, we're willing to become French, but the French weren't willing to let them become French. So they, they, they reneged on their own deal, and that's a problem when you renege on your own deal. The United States didn't really renege on its own deal. The United States had the Charles Taylor types to, to help them. I mean, no one told the United States to renege on their deal. We kind of philosophically decided the deal was a problem. The, the minority groups decided it was a problem, which, as I said, caused themselves situation. I do have perhaps a final kind of, if you were writing the book now, would that conclusion look the same or would it look different and in what ways? I mean, the, the conclusion would, the conclusion would be the same, the, the available arguments would be significantly stronger. I mean, I, I, I told, I mean, Igor knows we used to run this summer program in Croatia for American students and we would teach them about the rise and fall of Yugoslavia, of course. And um, as a final exam, I would always give them a question, which was a scenario of the United States in 2020, which was clearly based on Yugoslavia and the United States was falling apart and breaking into pieces. And for five or six years, I gave that exam and not one student ever said, okay, yes, this could happen. They always said, hey, hey you're a very smart professor um, and we see the analogy, but no way. The United States has, you're, you're just making this up. This, this is absolutely impossible. Um, I don't think they would say that anymore. Um, so again, at that point, I was kind of guessing that this was happening and it was still very early on. Now, unfortunately, it's much ob more obvious that it's happening. So, you know, would I, would I like wave a redder flag and say, hello guys, um, this is this is becoming even bigger a problem than than I thought it was then. Yeah, I mean, I would would you know it's it's always dis, you, one always wishes that one were understood as a prophet in one's own time. I mean, I suspect right. So I always go, why don't why don't why don't people read this book and say what a smart guy this guy was? He under he saw what was happening twenty five years ago, right? Somebody somehow nobody does that, right? I mean, I don't get called by the New York Times to say. You were really smart 25 years ago. No one else saw this. Why did you see it? They, somehow they don't call. You call, yeah. Um, somehow, somehow, I don't get as much publicity. Yeah, yeah, right. Again, I don't, I don't somehow get as much publicity as you, from you guys as I would from the New York Times. But what can I do? Um, so, you know, so, so of course, one, one, I mean, again, do, do I, am I happy that the United States is looking more like Yugoslavia? No, I'm not happy that the United States is looking more like Yugoslavia. I, so you're always a little bit happy that you're right. I mean, or somewhat right. But again, so no, I'm not happy. But 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 I am. I don't think I would. I, the overall conclusion is absolutely the same. 
unfortunately, there's a lot more um, direct evidence for its truth than there was 25 years ago. So now, now I wouldn't write it probably because it's like any idiot could write it now. <laughs> so. uh, good. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for for uh, sharing your thoughts uh, uh, with us. Uh, the, the the book is available in in Serbian on on, on various We're websites. A pirate website near you, <laughs> exactly. And I think that the argument still holds, and it was very illuminating uh, research into literature and education and culture in in Yugoslavia uh, from the beginning and uh, until the end. Uh, Andrew wrote some some other very important for us writers. It's called "Remaining Relevant After Communism." about the role of the writer and how that changed, how writers are unfortunately are not the short history of, of the Balkans that Andrew Andrew wrote some ten, ten years ago and there's obviously a lot of other other publications so um, um, next time you come let's let's hope there will be some 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 good news Sto posto mlečna, kremasta, a tako vlagana. Prezident Light Pavlov.